Well, you know, it's really great. I just got word on the way in that David and Margarita Jackson just had their baby. This, they just, she just went into, I'm sorry, she just went into labor this morning. So she doesn't have the baby yet, but she's, uh, it's coming out right now. So if you think you have hardship. <laughs> well, you know, today, uh, today we continue our study of the book of Hebrews. And, uh, and, and at this time, if, if you don't have a handout and you need a handout, if you could please raise your hand. Uh, the ushers have extra handouts right now. And uh, we have them in English and in Spanish. So if anybody needs it in Spanish, go ahead and raise your hand. And Nana will get on right now, making sure you all get those. Uh, Nana, if you can get the handouts out. Amen. Maybe a couple brothers can go back and grab them right there, help Nana out. He's getting extra chairs. So. All right, guys. So chapter 2. You know, last week we covered chapter 1 of Hebrews. And, uh, you know, our series is entitled Superior in Every Way. And uh, last week we talked about God and Jesus being the right hand of God. And uh, how superior he is to all other messengers of God's word. And so, you know, the Bible, let's get into it here. The Bible it is first and foremost a love story. You know, God wants to draw you closer to himself. You know, and... Uh, in a more intimate way to put it, God wants to spend the rest of his life with you. You know, and, and you know, if you didn't catch that, that's all of eternity. You know, you got to really love somebody a lot when you want to spend all eternity with that person. You know what I'm saying? But he wants an everlasting relationship with you. Not only does he want a relationship with you, but like every great parent... He wants you to have a life that's superior to all other lives. You know what I'm saying? Because as, as a parent, all you parents know what I'm talking about here, right? You have kids and you want them to have the very best. You know, if they play basketball, you want them to have the very best basketball shoes. You, you, you know, if you, want them, if you want them to play tennis, you want them to have the best tennis racket. As parents, we want the best for our kids. You know, you can't always buy the best tennis shoes. But that's, a, that's good. You still want it for your kids. You know what I'm saying? But see, God wants the best for you. He wants you to have the very best life. Now, the cool thing about God is he can give you all those things. But he calls for us to do some things as well. You know, there's a fundamental thing about a relationship that we've got to understand. Because we can get into all this text and all the technicalities of the Bible and, and, and all the great passages but this is about a relationship between you and your creator. And, and there's a fundamental thing about a relationship that you've got to understand if that relationship's going to be successful. If a relationship is going to be successful, then what you got to do is you have to work to please one another and meet each other's needs. If you don't do that, it's not going to be a successful relationship. You know, the more that you know each other's needs and you don't meet them, the more strained the relationship is. You know what I'm saying? And so, that means you've got to put forth some effort to find out what the other person's needs are. And so, in this case, the relationship is with God. And we go, well, what is God's will and what is his needs? Well, God's will and his need is simply this. To honor him, to worship him, and to obey him. You know, most people don't think of God as having a need. But just like every parent, God does have a need. He has a need to have a relationship with every one of his children. And so, you meet his need by having a great relationship with him. Now, if you turn around and have a, you, you fulfill God's need to go after him and to honor him and to worship him and to obey him, what do you think he's going to do for you? You think he's just going to, you know, kick you to the curb? You know, oh, well, just, he's going to let you suffer. He's going to let every, all these bad things continue to happen. You know, no, that God's going to meet your needs as well. Because God never goes back on his end of the relationship. And so, you know, but let's talk about you. What's your need? Well, we don't think this way typically, but we're all the same. We all have the same need. That need is to be fulfilled, to be completely happy and content. And so the Bible defines that as what we call blessed. Now, those of you who have studied the Bible with us, you go, oh, I know what that means. Because in the very first study, you talked about being blessed and seeking after God with all your heart. 
And, and so life as a disciple of Jesus is really easy. You please God, God pleases you. You meet God's need, and God meets yours. It's a really simple, straightforward relationship. It's the fundamental teaching about having a relationship with God. It's what we do in the very first study. It's called Seeking God. We talk about seeking after a relationship with God with not just part of your heart, not just most of your heart, but with how much, guys? With all of your heart. You know, that's the first and most basic fundamental teaching about Jesus. We call it Seeking God. And when we get to Hebrews chapter 6, when we get to the study on chapter 6 in this series, we're going to talk all about the history of our first principle studies and where they came from so that you can just you can see just how powerful they are and how they did come straight from all the scriptures. And it's not a teaching of men. But you know, the Bible is filled with all kinds of warnings. It's filled, but it's also filled with all kinds of promises for you. And you got to realize God wants the best relationship for you, so he's not going to go back on the promises. So these are things that we have got to hold on to. So let's jump into Hebrews chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 1. Now if you look at your hand out here, you'll see highlighted throughout the first page here is five warnings. And in the book of Hebrews, it was written primarily to people who had become Christians and, and had begun to drift away from and so the five warnings are actually the five stages of what happens in our heart when we have a relationship with God, but we begin to drift. And so these are the five stages that we go through before we walk away and ultimately make the worst choice that anyone could ever make and to not ever turn back to God. So today we're covering the very first warning. The title of our message, I've entitled it the title of the first warning. The title of today's message is Pay more careful attention. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's see if we don't identify with some of the things that we read. The Bible says we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Well, you know, already right here, we just got one verse, but there is so much packed in this one verse that we just got to camp out for a little bit, you know? The, 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 the very first point today is pay more careful attention. You, you notice that the Bible here doesn't say you must pay more careful attention. You know, it doesn't say that because the person that wrote Hebrews was in touch with the fact that no matter where you're at today, no matter where I'm at, we all must pay more careful attention to what we've seen and heard when it comes to God. You know, it doesn't matter if you feel like you're doing good. It doesn't mean feel. It doesn't matter if you feel if you already know you've drifted away, or if you kind of feel like you might be. All of us need to pay more careful attention to God's word. See, the problem though is our society is not geared toward paying close attention to what they do. You know, the, the, our society's not geared toward taking care of things right on the spot. Johnny on the spot. You know, when I interviewed people at, at work, I had to really search to find folks who were really paid close attention, who are detail-oriented people. Because our society has driven that out of people. You know, we tend to focus, instead of how much we can be on the job, how much we can pay very careful attention, we tend to focus on, okay, well, how many times can I be late before I actually get in real trouble? You know, how many questions can I miss and still pass the test? You know, that, that, that our, for some reason, our minds just seem to focus and hone in on what we don't have to do instead of being on top of what we should be doing and paying very careful attention. You know, right here in verse 1, there's two key phrases. The first one is pay careful attention. The second is so that we do not drift away. You know, when you study this passage in the Greek... They're two very common Greek phrases. They're used right here in the Bible, but yet if you read other Greek literature from the first century, you come to find they're very common phrases in the nautical world having to do with boats. The first is prosecco, which means to take earnest heed. And it's used in describing when someone takes a boat and ties it to the dock to keep it anchored down. The second is parahui. It means to drift away. See, this, is, this was used 
for a ship. You know, we have, a har we have harbors, and all the ships come through the ocean, and they got to make it into the harbor to dock, right? And this is the word that's used when a captain isn't paying attention, and his ship just drifts on past the harbor. And, and so right here, what the writer's telling us is that you have got to anchor yourself to God's word. That has got to be the very thing, the foundation of your life that keeps you anchored in any and every situation. Because if you don't anchor yourself to God's word, you're going to drift right on past the harbor of God. And let me tell you something. You better not drift past the harbor of salvation. Because there's only one of them. And if you drift right on by, you're going to miss it. But you know, this is tied to another incredible scripture. Keep your place and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Y'all with me? All right. The singing got a whole lot better in the last second half of the service. That was exciting, you know. You guys helped me out. You know, it's hard to preach when the singing's not so great, you know. So you guys got me all ready to preach. That's awesome. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. This is one of the most famous passages in the Bible. He says, so, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. What a great passage. You, you, you know, today, if you feel like, hey, dude, I'm doing awesome. You know, I, I actually don't even really, didn't even really need this church service. I'd be doing cranking without it, you know. You better be careful because you might fall. And you know, we all fall. We all have hard times. We all at different times come in through that door right there and we bring our problems. Instead of leaving the problems out of the house of God, we bring them right on in with us. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and yet, you know, we all do it. And we all need those times and those reminders. God is faithful. He will not let you... Now, this is where people confuse this passage here. Okay, God absolutely, in your current state of mind, God absolutely will let you be tempted beyond what you can do. See, God's counting on the fact that you're a man or a woman of your word so that you're going to go after him. So when something is beyond what you can bear, that you're going to turn to him and he's going to be faithful, give you strength, and then you can stand up again. And that helps you grow. And, and many people mistake that, that. You know, why is this so tough? God says he won't give me more than I can bear. Well, he won't if you'll dig in his word and anchor yourself to what he says. If you'll take hold of those promises, read your Bible, and hold on to it with dear, for dear life, God will absolutely give you a way out. Because that's just the kind of person he is. That's just the kind of God he is. He wants a great relationship. But see, this passage also talks a lot about idolatry. It's something that people don't really want to hear about a lot. But it is the, it is the number one reason why people drift. You know, why does the captain drift right on past the harbor with his ship? Because he took his eyes off the prize, off the goal, of getting into the harbor, and got focused on something else. And that's what—that's all idolatry is. We make it oh, It's a very practical, normal thing that all of us do at times. Is we take our eyes off of God and off of Jesus, and we get them on something else. And when we do that, we drift. It's just like we're at the beach. You know, when you're standing on the beach. You can see the waves. You go, wow, those waves are pretty, coming in pretty hard, man. But you jump out in the water, and all of a sudden, you're just getting tossed back and forth. And you start having fun. Woo, this is cool. And you get all focused on the waves. And next thing you know, you're half a mile down the beach. And you're searching, where's my stuff? It was right there. Because you drifted away. Because you took your eyes off of what was important. And, and you know, see, when you don't anchor yourself to you drift away from that very word. And, and it's an amazing thing. You know, God's word is so powerful. Think about the story in Genesis. God's word created everything that you see in there. You know, when you read God's word, it creates life in your heart when you feel that. Just like he created the entire world, he creates life in your heart and in your eyes when you get into his word and anchor yourself to it. You see, but when you don't anchor yourself, you drift. And when you drift, you're headed for Gilligan's Island because you're making a shipwreck in your life when you pull away from God's word. 
You know, and that brings us to the topic of, you know, one of the biggest things that causes us to drift is dating. And so, you know, I think it's an appropriate topic. You know, we, because the topic right here is pay careful attention. Well, you know, I remember when I was dating Tracy. It was really awesome. You know, you know, I paid very, very careful attention to everything that I did on every single day. Uh, you know, I had my nice Chrysler Sebring, fully polished, chrome rim, black, you know, convertible. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, I washed it. I, got, I made sure there was not a spot of dirt on it. And then I drove all the way, like 30 miles to go on our date. And then I got up there and I got my damp rag and my dry rag out. And I cleaned the whole car again to make sure it was totally clean. You know, my shirt was pressed. My, my, my pants were pressed. My shoes were polished. And, and, you know, I looked pretty good then. You know, I actually brushed my teeth, brothers, you know. It, it, it was awesome. Minty fresh, you know. I, I brushed my teeth. I, I had my cologne on probably too much. I got all excited. And, and you know, it's a funny thing. I actually stayed in shape during that time. It was cool. And, but, you know, I used to get dressed up. Tracy used to get super dressed up for our kids. She looked pretty good. But, you know, we can drift away when we get married and, and, and we don't spend so much time working to make each other feel as special you know what I mean any married couples know what I'm talking about am I the only one that does that no okay okay I just want to make sure <laughs> thought I was awful you know but but you know the the, the relationship the, how we go after dating how we go after marriage ties so much to how we go after God because we, we, we come into having a relationship with God, and we go after it, and we pay very careful attention. We, we get our notes from the study, and we're like, wow, this is, this is all awesome. And let uh, me go read it in the morning. We read our notes and everything, and, and, and then we get baptized. It's like marriage, you know, you get married to God, amen? And uh, it's okay, guys, you get married to God, it's good. There's nothing wrong with that. And, 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 but then you begin to not pay such careful attention. Oh, you know, oh, I didn't get up quite on time. And you don't get all dressed up for God. Your breath stinks for God because of how you talk. You know, you don't put on any cologne. You don't stay in shape. And, and this is what happens. You know, but we can also have the flip side where we, we really focus so much on our day that it turns to idolatry. And we focus more on what we do on our date than what we do in our time. And when we do that, we begin to drift. And you know how you can tell when somebody's drifting? They, they don't come into service ready to sleep. They don't come prepared to worship God when they come into God's house. They, can, they, they just drift on in late, you know, consistently. And we all get, we all late at times. You know, there are people hating helping David and Margarita this morning, those people would be like, hey, amen, you know, that, that happens. But when, but when you're putting something else before God, you do it consistently. Every day. It becomes a rare thing when you come in on time. Go to James chapter 1. There's an awesome passage that ties to this. James chapter 1. And, and you know, I, I want to help us with our thinking here because because in Hebrews, there's lots of warnings. There's lots of challenges. And we have to have the right perspective about challenges. You know, I can say some things that you may not be living out or may not be doing. And you know what? I don't do all of them all the time either. But you know, the challenges come for a very awesome reason. And they are to keep us faithful for the rest of our lives. And that's a doggone good thing. And it's something that should really fire you up. To learn, to grow, so that you can stay faithful. Don't get caught up in Satan's trap while we're going through this study series, feeling like, oh, I just don't measure up. None of us measure up. You're not Jesus, and neither am I. And, but we, so we got to have the right perspective on the challenges. The challenges aren't to make you feel bad. The challenges are to help you grow. The challenges are to strengthen you, to take you to a place that you've not gone before, and so that we can get closer and closer. And when, when we do that, we live out the challenge that God gives us to seek Him with all of our heart. 
Because there's so much more in your heart that, that you've not tapped into. There's so much more in the relationship with God that you have to learn if you'll continue to grow. So let's take these challenges as an encouragement, not a beatdown. Amen? In James chapter 1, in verse 22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Just do it. You know, Nike thought they had the corner on that on that saying. They stole it from the Bible and they didn't even pay they didn't even pay the gratuity for it, you know, whatever they call it. They just stole it. You know? But you know, he, he says, don't just listen to the Bible. Pay more careful attention to what you read. Let it hit your heart. Meditate on it. Get into it. Dig into it. And most importantly, Bring it to completion by doing what it says. It says anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. You know, some of us do that sometimes. Some of us in here look at our face in the mirror. It says, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Some of us would like to do that. I know. I would. <laughs> He says, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it. Check this out. He will be blessed in what he does. You know, like I said, life as a Christian is really easy. You hear God's word. You honor him. You worship him. You obey his word. And then he blesses your life with all the desires. But the question is, you know, most of you have read lots of God's word. Most of you, many of you in here have been baptized as true Christians. They're living a life. Do you forget? Have you forgotten what you looked like when you went in the water? Have you forgotten how humble you were? How, how well you took direction in your life and corrections and, and, and how eager you were to be trained? You know, this morning is a time to remember what you look like. This morning is a time to pay more careful attention to God's word to make sure that you're living in it. You see, we cannot live as Americans when it comes to having a relationship with God. See, because as Americans, we like remote controls. We like to click email and have the response come right back. You know, it's funny. I was, I was, I was working on a paper with this guy last week and sent him an email and click send and I think about three seconds of buying yourself. It's not here yet. I just click send. I know, but it's not here yet. You know, before, people used to have to write their letters out, put them in an envelope, get on their bike and ride, or get on their horse and ride to deliver that letter. You know, then, then they came up with this great thing, the postal service. And, and then you had to actually lick the stamp, and then people complained because they had to lick the stamp. And it took a whole week to get there, or, or a month, you know, when they first started. And, and now we're now us as Americans, you know, here, here's our patience. Click. Okay, dude, it's been like five seconds. What the heck's wrong with my email provider, man? What idiots! Yeah, yeah, but, but you know, we can't live like Americans. We've got to live as true followers who have patience, who are eager to learn, who are eager to grow. See, you've got to anchor yourselves to God's words this morning. And pay careful attention to what you heard. Let's go ahead and move on. We got verse 1 out of the way. <laughs> Let's move on to our second point. Our second point is, is stop ignoring salvation. It's a charge. Stop ignoring salvation. Verse 2 of Hebrews. Chapter 2, verse 2. He says, For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how should we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? The salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard it. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit it distributed according to His will. You go, wow, Ron, are you really telling me that I can ignore salvation that's right, sitting right in front of me? Absolutely. You know, salvation is right in front of all of us. It's right before us every single day. And yes, you can ignore it. 
The horrible thing is if you ignore salvation, you will lose it. You know, and it's pretty funny. This week, uh, I took Dylan, my youngest son, to the dentist. And uh, he doesn't like going to the dentist. And, you know, it's a funny thing. If you, if you brush your teeth every day, three times a day, right? That's what they say, right? And you floss your teeth in between, and you use all the right toothpaste and everything, when you go to the dentist, you feel pretty awesome. But if you don't live that way, going to the dentist is the time where you have to take responsibility for the way you've lived. And so, and so Dylan doesn't like going to the dentist because he doesn't like brushing his teeth. And he went in one other time when he hadn't lived the right way. And he had to have a tooth pulled. And, you know, my son, I love him to death. He, he, you know, he's awesome. He wants to be a preacher, he says. He said that for the last two years. But we strapped him in that chair the first time. And they, and, and, and they took that needle, and you, you know how they do it? They, and they, shake, your t- and they shake your lip, and, 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 you know, it felt pretty numb, and he was drooling, and, oh, God, what are we doing? And, yeah. But then it wasn't enough. See, he had lived so badly that they had to drill so deep that even the Novocaine didn't help. And I saw the movie Exorcist that day. And I, I, I'll never forget the sight, man. Dylan, he was like, Mother, son of a son! And I never heard my son cuss. I was like, oh my gosh. And he was cussing. I mean, he was in pain. And, you know, taking responsibility isn't fun. It could have been a whole, hey, great job, man. You're brushing every day. It's all, you know, good checkup. No, no, he, he, he hadn't lived that way. And, you know, there's a day when we all have to take responsibility for how we live. We think it's that last day only. But, you know, in any relationship, if you don't work to please the other person and meet their needs, if you don't do the work to find out what they need, and if you don't meet their needs... There comes a day when you have to take responsibility for that when you argue about all these things. There comes a day when the other person feels hurt because you haven't lived in a way to please them. It's the same with God. Go to John chapter 8, verse 31. Me personally, I just stopped going to the dentist. (laughs) <laughs> you gotta keep it real you know I do brush my teeth every day amen. I still brush my teeth before my dates with my wife I didn't last night amen you know last night Tracy and I went on a date and, you know it was, it was really awesome you know uh, it, was, it was pretty cool you know we had uh, we had Alex who's studying the bible over here you know Kevin and Shayla had their baby this week as well and, uh, and her mother's out here, and she's there taking care of the baby with them. And, and Alex is here with, with us, and he's been studying the Bible. And it was really odd. You know, last night my mom took the kids and, in the morning, and we got all fired up. We're going to go on a date, you know. And, and then sometime in the afternoon, we, it, it, you know, the, out of the whole region of the South, nobody could get with the, the study with Richard and Alex. So I said, all right, let's just put the movie back. And, you know, we went and jumped in the study, and it was the awesome, it was the most awesome thing, man. Uh, we had a great time. It's good when you put aside your own life to, to put God first and other people's salvation and where they stand with God. And so, you know, you always feel awesome about that. And, and so, and then afterwards, you know, we went on our date. It's pretty cool. But I was in my basketball shorts and my basketball shirt and no cologne. And, and, you know, we went and had the movie and, you know, Tracy dressed up a little more than I did. But, but I realized, man, I drifted. I haven't been putting that same energy and effort. And so, we got to stop drifting. i got to pay more careful attention. So all you brothers can help me out next week. Make sure that I get all dressed up and make my wife feel as special as she deserves to be. Man. In John chapter 8, verse 31. At least I went on a date, right? <laughs> Amen. Woo! All right. Most of you guys would have just said, oh, I did the study. It's 9 o'clock. I'm not going to go on the date, you know. But, yeah, push through. 
for your what? John 8, verse 31. He says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is such an incredible passage. You know, because it's a passage about, that just really lays out there, whether you're going after salvation, or whether you're ignoring it. You know, he says, if, and any time the Bible says if, or therefore, or, you know, you, you, know, you, you got to read the scriptures backwards if you want to get everything out of it. Because he says, you know, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. But then you got to go, well, wait a minute, what if I don't hold to teachings? Okay, if you don't hold to my teachings, then what does that mean? Wow. But wait, but I believe in God. You're going to have to wrestle with that with God. Because his word says, if you don't hold to his teachings, then you're not really a follower. And so he, he says, but, but the cool thing is the promise in this passage. See, because we got the incredible challenge in the passage. And we can focus on that and get all down. Oh, my gosh, I blew it. You know, I had a horrible thought for a split second yesterday. I'm not holding to his teachings. Or we can look at the promise, which is, if you hold to my teachings, you're, you're a true follower. But not, not only are you a true follower, but then you will know the truth. So what does that say about if you don't obey God's word consistently about your knowledge of the truth? It means that you can ignore that salvation and you can actually steal the truth away from yourself by disobeying God's word. And he goes on to say, if you hold to that truth, that you'll be set free. I don't know about you, but there are things that try to enslave my soul every day. I have temptations that I go through. I have hardships that I go through. I've got hurts from my past. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff in there to enslave me. But the Bible promises me, if I hold to his, his teachings, then I will know the truth about all these things and why God let me have them. And he will set me free from the bondage that is in all those situations. Now, how about you? How about you? Do you really want to have a great relationship with God? Because what it takes isn't just reading his word and going about your day just like you would have done the day before. But letting his word change your life, holding to those teachings, actually having the faith to live out what he says. And then you will experience a life that is superior than all others. But see, somehow we think that God's all talk. You, you know, a lot of us had parents that threatened to discipline us. <laughs> my wife, I guess my wife's convicted. Amen. <laughs> you know, a lot of us had parents who threatened to discipline us, but didn't actually follow through. And so what happens is when you live that way, you're, that's where the, how many times can I be late comes from? How many questions can I miss and still get my driver's license? And that's what builds that thinking. And we begin to think that God's all talk. That he's like that little chihuahua. It never actually does anything. But God's not a chihuahua. God actually keeps his word. See, he keeps all of his promises. All the ones to give you a great life. And all the ones of what will happen at judgment if you don't live the way he calls you to live. And, you know... In verses 2 of 3 of, chapter, of Hebrews 2 there that we were reading, he says, if you keep drifting, if you keep ignoring me and my word, I'm going to have to live out. I'm going to have to do what I said I was going to do. See, no parent likes to spank their kids. No parent likes to bring discipline. No parent likes to put someone on restriction. But they must keep their word in order for their word to mean something. And in order for God's word to mean something to you, he has to follow through with the consequences that he says are going to be there if you don't obey. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Y'all still with me? Amen. We're growing, right? 1 Peter chapter 2. See, we think that God is just all talk. At least that's the way we live a lot of the time. You know, well, I'll, re I'll repent someday. 
I'll get it down. I'm, you know, I'm trying. Trying is lying. We do or we don't. He says, you hold to my teaching, you realize disciples, or you don't hold to it and you're not. There's no gray area in that passage. You know what I'm saying? And, and so he says right here in 1 Peter 2, in verse 13. This is a deep passage. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to most of the authorities that are out there. You know? No, 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 he doesn't say that. See, we don't like authority as Americans. We don't like somebody having authority over us. We especially don't like somebody telling us what to do. And yet right here the Bible says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted amongst men. Not just God. Whether to the king as a supreme authority, or to the governors, or who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong. And to commend those who do right. For it is God's will. See, we talked about his will and what pleases him. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. What a powerful passage. You know, how could God tell all of us, obey every authority that's out there? The policemen, obey them. The president, obey. All the laws of the land, obey them. No more speeding. You can, you can, amen. You can get some amens on that, you know. I caught myself this morning. I was, I was running a little, I was coming like a couple minutes before, and I was like, and I looked, and I was like, oh, man, I guess I'm speeding. Dang it. I'm going to preach about it, too. But, but how could God say, obey all these people? But it's okay for you to disobey me. I'm all about grace. Just keep sending up a storm. It's okay. I'm all good. I'm just all talk. No. That's not the God that is in the Bible. You see, inherently, we know already. You know what I'm saying? You know already. You know you shouldn't speak. You know you shouldn't take those pencils from work. <laughs> Got Ecclesiastes 3. But see, we've got we've to pay careful attention. That's what the scripture says. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you don't know where that is, open your Bible right into the middle and a couple of a couple of books back, right, right before Isaiah. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. See, this is awesome. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You know, God wants you to have the best. He makes everything beautiful for a time if we, if we don't mess it up. If we don't mess it up, it stays beautiful. He says he has also set eternity on the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know there's nothing better for men than to be happy, to do good while they live. You know, God has set eternity on your heart. You already know whether you claim to believe or not, whether whether you're just sitting here chilling because somebody made you come or not, you already know in your heart of hearts that there is heaven and that there is hell. The, the cool thing is, this is what makes my job as a preacher really easy. You already know if you don't live a right way, you're not going to go to heaven. I don't have to tell you that. God did that for me. You have eternity set on your heart. And yet, we attach ourselves so tightly to other things that we just ignore that thought. We get so caught up in the moment and in our pleasure that we ignore that thought and thus ignore salvation. This is how you know eternity is on the hearts of all men. This is how you know they all know there's heaven and hell because everybody tries to claim heaven right before they die. Everyone tries to claim heaven and being right with God on their deathbed. And in your heart of hearts, you know that 
there's a heaven and there's a hell. You know there's a God already. You know that his word is his word. And all you got to do is just listen to him. Life's disciples a piece of cake. You please God, honor him, worship him, obey him, and God takes care of every one of your needs. See, but that's what the drifting does. Drifting causes you to forget that. It causes you to ignore. It doesn't really cause you to forget. It causes you to ignore it. But a little taste of somebody dying in your life brings it all back to reality. And you'll stop ignoring the salvation. See, there's a lot of things that you can afford to ignore in life. Salvation is not one of them. You must pay more careful attention to what you heard. Amen? Go to Third point. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 5. Hebrews 2, verse 5. Right here the Bible says, It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. And now he goes in to to quote Psalm chapter 4. He says, What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You ever got a demotion at work? You know, God actually demoted Jesus for a while for you. He says, you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is subject to him. This is where he's he's trying to convince us God is, Jesus is superior to all of us. Taking the way that Jesus calls us to go is far superior. Everything is subjective to him. He says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for you. That's the way you got to read the Bible. You can't say everyone because you disconnect. See, that's the way I got to read So that by the grace of God, He might taste death for me. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom through all everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Wow. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. And he says, now he quotes Psalm twenty-two, twenty-two. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Our third point is, remember Jesus, the superior messenger. You see, God really challenges us with these first parts of the chapter. But then he brings us back and he says, Look, you've got to remember who I sent to you. I sent you Jesus. See, all this drifting and things that happen in our lives come for, from forgetting who Jesus was. See, we ignore his words and we begin to drift because we forget who he was and how powerful his words were. We forget that his words created this world. You see, he uses some quotes from Psalms and Isaiah right in this section of the passage here to reiterate to us, who's man? Who the heck are you? We think so highly of ourselves. And he wants us to remember who Jesus was and who we are so that we can realize what God did for us. He says, man, you know, you're ignoring me and my words, but I'm the one who should be ignoring you. And, and you know, but he says, not only did I not ignore you, I sent you my pride and joy. I took my right hand from heaven and I brought him down and I made him like scum on the earth. He says, in fact, I took him and I made him just like you. So that he wouldn't be ashamed of you. 
See, if, if Jesus kept his high status in heaven, he would be ashamed of who we are on earth here. The way we talk, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we act, the way we give into our flesh. But God had to take Jesus and demote him and make him just like us so that he would feel all the same temptations. You ever had one of those temptations? It, it, it just grips you. It, it just grabs you. It, it, oh, I, can't, I can't control myself. It's just driving me crazy. That's what Jesus felt too. And we forget what kind of messenger Jesus was. He felt everything that he he had every fear that you feel. He had every temptation that you had. He got all the way to the point that none of us have ever gotten to, and he sweat drops of blood because the temptation to give up was so strong. I mean, we stress out and we get we get headaches. And, oh man, my temptation is huge. And, and, and yet we forget that Jesus went farther than that. Jesus went all the way till the temptation took him all the way to death. He let himself die instead of giving in. He said, I took my prince from heaven and I, and I handed him over to you. I demoted him and then after I demoted him, I let him suffer greatly at your own hands for your sins. Remember, Jesus the superior messenger. See, God says, don't you realize, don't you realize what I did for you? You've got to pay more careful attention to what you heard. We'll close out here in Hebrews 2, verse 14. Stick with me now, all right? In verse 14, he says, since the, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. And that's you, amen? For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. God closes out this chapter with an incredible inspiration. You know, he says, you got to pay more careful attention. you got to stop ignoring my salvation. you got to remember my son Jesus, who is your messenger. But you know what he says at the end here? If he can do it, so can you. You, you, you see, the rest of the, 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 the remainder of this chapter is an incredible, incredibly motivating charge. That you can live it. Just look at your brother and what he did. You see, the problem in our lives and living it out is that we're, we're weak in our character. You know, before I was a Christian, I was so proud about how strong I am. I studied philosophy, and I looked down on everybody that was, that was religious in any way. So you just use you just you're just weak. You need religion as a crutch. That's what I told all the people that shared the faith. I said you're too weak to stand up on your own two feet and just do what's right. You need you need some instructional booklet to figure it out. At least the one thing I had on straight is that God said eternity on everyone's heart. We all know inherently right and wrong, and, and, and yet. As I, be, as I really began to be impacted by Jesus and his words and his life, I began to see how weak of a man I was. You know, he's saying, he's saying to us here, you're ignoring me and my words. Like, you, you, I shouldn't even be mindful of you. And you ignore me. And, see, the problem is, we're, the, we're Americans. We love remote controls and, and email and sofas. We like 24. It's done now. Sorry. You know, we like lost because we're lost. We like things now and we like them easy. And it warps our minds. You know, a lot of people talk about brainwashing, but let me tell you something. The world is brainwashed. 
People focus on cults and people controlling you. Don't tell me what to do. That's because they're brainwashed. You need somebody to tell you what to do. You need an instructional booklet to keep you straight. Or else you're just going to drift on by. You're going to do your own thing and keep making a shipwreck of your life. You see, the awesome thing right here is Jesus. He's the determining factor in all of this. I mean, think about it. He lived such a hard life. They wanted to take him and throw him off the edge of a cliff because he told them the truth. They wanted to stone him. Then they kicked him, spit on him, put a crown of thorns in his head, mocked him, stripped him of his clothes, beat him, put nails in his hands, let him sit up there all night long like that and laughed at him the whole time, calling themselves followers of God. And, and you know, if Jesus had used his divine nature to go through all that, he wouldn't have been an acceptable sacrifice. If he even for one second used God's power to overcome it instead of his own desire to save you as a human being, he would have been flawed. And you got to remember, Jesus did all of it using nothing more than what you yourself have. It's so important to understand. Jesus was flesh and blood. He felt every blow. He felt every insult. He he felt every bit of mocking that was sent at him. And he was much more in touch with his emotions. And he felt more than this. And and you know, you just got to look at your own life. What things are difficult for you to obey in the scriptures? I mean, do you want somebody to magically intervene for you, or do you really want to go to heaven? I mean, you go, well, I got issues with my purity. I don't know that I can be totally pure. The temptation drives me crazy. Well, you know what? That temptation drove Jesus crazy, too. He didn't use any special powers. He just loved God with all of his heart. You know, I don't believe that. I don't know. I, I can't just be totally committed and then take care of my family. It just doesn't work. Yes, it does, or the Bible wouldn't say it. You know, I know many of you are suffering with giving money. We hit, we hit all things. You know, we keep it real here. I know there's a lot of you suffering money because you're a thousand bucks short last week. Just one week. You can't run a church like that. I understand the pain. I had less than five bucks in my bank account when I gave my contribution. We're, we keep it all real. I, my salary is thirty-six thousand a year. I give two hundred twenty-five dollars a week. I still gave. I gave because I know God will take care of me. I, I mean, do you believe? Do you believe that you can hold to the teachings wholeheartedly, in, especially when it's tough? That's when God will bless you the most. And He says, you know, if you if you don't believe it, look at your big brother. And I, I love the fact that I have two boys because it helps me to look at Jesus as my big brother. I watch Dylan and everything that Devin does. Devin's far more athletic than Dylan. He goes climbing trees, doing all this crazy stuff. And you know what Dylan does? He looks at his brother and he goes, if he can do that, so can I. And he wants to try everything. I mean, it's funny. He gets jacked up. He, he tries the same things Devin does and he falls. And you know, he's got scrapes all up his arm and everything. You know, and that's what happens to us when we try. We go, Jesus did it, so do I. Okay, I'm going to be humble this, in this D time. And then somebody's just all in spiritual. Oh, but you this, you that. It, it doesn't act right. And so we go, oh my gosh, it doesn't work. And yet, if you push through, it does work. If you make it past the hump, it does work. And you persevered and you went through it. And so it's awesome. It's kind of like... For me, it's kind of like getting into really cold water. You know, you know, it's summertime. you got the nice pool. and People are jumping in. You know, How's the water? Oh, it's awesome. Get in. You look, you look like you look like Will Ferrell and Elf. You're like. <laughs> no, but, but then eventually you go, well, if they can get in, so can I. And then eventually you just jump on in. And then it's awesome. And you're having a great time. See, that's how God wants you to live. He wants you to look at your big brother, Jesus, and realize he was just like you. He had more challenges than you, and he dealt with them all the way to the point of death. So this morning, guys, let's anchor ourselves to God's word. 
Let's stop ignoring the salvation that's right in front of us. Let's remember what God did for us. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus and pay more careful attention to what we've heard. Have an awesome afternoon. I love you all very much.